This is the third video for the topic on how does a nuclear power plant work. In this video we're going to be looking at medical applications of nuclear radiation. In this video we're going to be looking at applications, especially to medicine, of nuclear radiation. We're going to start this by comparing and contrasting the properties of alpha, beta and gamma radiation. The, these different properties mean that these different types of radiation are suitable for different applications. So it's important to understand their properties before we start. So as we said in the previous video, alpha radiation consists of helium nuclei. So an alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons. This means that relative to the other radiation, alpha particles are fairly heavy with a mass of 6.64 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Beta particles, on the other hand, are electrons. So these are much lighter than protons and neutrons. A beta particle has a mass of 9.109 9 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And gamma radiation is photons, or electromagnetic radiation. So it's actually massless. Now these masses mean that these different radiation types have different ionizing abilities. The ionizing ability of a particle describes its ability to knock electrons out from other atoms. So atoms have the nucleus with the electrons around them. If a heavy particle comes through, then it's quite likely to knock one of those orbital electrons out of that atom. For this reason, we say that the ionizing ability of alpha radiation is high. It's easy for alpha particles to remove electrons from atoms. We say that beta particles have a medium ionizing ability, as it's possible for an electron to hit another electron out of an atom, but not as easy as for alpha radiation. And gamma radiation, as it just consists of electromagnetic radiation, finds it much harder to ionize atoms, and so the ionizing ability of gamma radiation is low. Now, typically, alpha particles relative to beta and gamma move much slower. This is because when alpha particles are created, we've got conservation of momentum, and because of the higher mass of the alpha particle, remember momentum is equal to mass times velocity, because the mass is higher, then the velocity tends to be lower. A beta particle has a lower mass, and so a higher velocity, and a gamma particle is electromagnetic radiation, and so it travels at the speed of light, and nothing can go faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. The other property of alpha, beta, and gamma that we want to consider is the penetrating power. So the penetrating power talks about how easy it is to stop alpha, beta, and gamma rays. Alpha rays are very heavy, and so they are actually very easy to stop. We can use a sheet of paper to protect ourselves from an alpha radiation source. So alpha radiation cannot travel through a sheet of paper. To stop beta particles, we need a few millimetres of aluminium. So a single sheet of aluminium foil isn't quite enough. We do need a few millimetres, but a few millimetres is adequate to stop beta particles. Gamma rays, on the other hand, are very penetrating. It's quite hard to stop them. We need many centimetres of lead in order to stop gamma radiation. So have a look at this table now. This summarises the properties of alpha, beta and gamma radiation. So a couple of the common uses of alpha radiation is actually in smoke detectors and also in internal radionuclei therapy. So let's consider smoke detectors first. Smoke detectors make use of the radioactive isotope americium-241. Now americium-241 is very unstable and so it's not found anywhere in nature. 
it actually has to be created in nuclear, ra in nuclear reactors for its use in smoke detectors. So americm 241 is a source of alpha radiation. For practice, let's write down the equation of the decay of americm 241 So we can write this as 24195am, which is the symbol for americium, turns into an alpha particle, which is 42helium. And then you can see that the atomic number needs to be 95 minus 2, so 93. The 93rd atom is neptunium. So, that, so we have NP as the symbol that is used for neptunium. And then you can see that the mass number needs to be 241 minus 4, so that gives us 237. So we, now we've written down the equation for the decay of americium 241. So what happens in the smoke detector is that a battery applies a voltage, a potential difference across two metal plates. So we have a positively charged plate and we have a negatively charged plate. We then have our americium source, which shoots alpha particles between these two plates. Now because alpha radiation has a high ionizing power, as it passes between the two plates, it collides with air. And air consists of nitrogen molecules and oxygen molecules. So as it collides with the nitrogen and oxygen, it tends to ionize these particles. And so we get a steady flow of negative charges up to the positive plate, because opposite charges attract, and of positive charges down to the negative plate. And so the smoke detector registers that as a small current. Now, if there's a whole lot of smoke in the air, then as the alpha particles travel between the two plates, they actually get stopped by the smoke particles. They get absorbed by the smoke. And so this means that the ionized oxygen and nitrogen stops getting to the two plates. And so that current, which the smoke detector was detecting, stops. This is what makes the smoke detector go off. So beep, 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 because it now knows that there's smoke or something in the way, and so it gives us a warning. So it's that ionizing ability of alpha radiation which makes it so appropriate for its use in smoke detectors. Now another common use is in internal radionuclide therapy, which is also known as brachiotherapy. This is an appropriate treatment for some cancers, such as cervical, prostate, breast and skin cancers. In this therapy, we have a very small implant, which is filled with the alpha source. Now we can have quite a high dosage in this case because the penetrating power of the alpha radiation is not very high. So it can't travel very far through your body. So wherever you put that implant, it's only going to affect tissue in the immediate vicinity. And so doctors insert these little canisters filled with the alpha sources into the center of the cancer and then it emits the alpha radiation, which is highly ionizing. And so this tends to kill off the cells. Cells which are dividing are particularly prone to the destruction of ionizing radiation. And so since cancer cells tend to divide more rapidly, they're even more at risk from being damaged by it. So this is a good way to kill off small tumors because we can use a very high dosage quite safely and it's a very localized effect. Beta particles are used in a couple of ways in medicine. One of the most famous ways is the PET scan or positron emission tomography scan. So in a PET scan, we're actually using positrons, which are the anti-beta particles. So it's still called beta radiation, but it's the positrons that are emitted rather than the electrons. So how these scans work is that patients are given a substance such as glucose, which is commonly found in the body. However, this glucose or other sugar is made with a radioisotope. 
So carbon-11 or oxygen-15 are often used. So this is injected into the bloodstream of the patient. It then makes its way through to the organs with the highest amount of blood flow. So this can be very good for brain scans because a lot of blood goes to your brain. The radioisotope then has a very short half-life, typically less than two hours. So there's a couple of reasons for this. It means that these it means that the radio source doesn't stay in your body for very long. After a few days, you won't have a detectable amount there. It also means that while the scan's going on immediately after the injection, then you've got a fairly strong source in order to detect the radiation. So you get injected, it goes through to your high blood flow organs, such as your brain, and all that time, the radioisotopes are decaying. And as they decay, because they're beta decay, they produce positrons. Now, the positron is the antiparticle of the electron. So if a positron and an electron meet, then they completely annihilate each other. Their entire mass gets converted into energy. And it's actually this energy which gets released in the form of electromagnetic radiation, which is picked up by the scanning equipment around the PET scanner. So this then lets the doctors get a good idea of the high blood flow regions inside the patient and they can use this to model what's going on in the human body and to see if something is going wrong inside. Beta particles can also be used to treat cancer in a similar way to how we use the alpha particle sources. So beta particles can, well, beta source emitters can be loaded into small canisters which are then implanted into the cancer. And as these decay, emitting beta radiation, the dividing cells are especially affected by it. And so the cancerous cells which divide more rapidly are the most affected. So the beta emitters can target larger cancers than the alpha emitters because there's more penetrating power. But this also has disadvantages because it means that it's more likely to target healthy tissue. And so beta particles or beta emitters are only used sparingly in medicine. Gamma rays are used quite a lot for scans in medicine. So we're going to be talking about how technetium 99M is used. But gamma rays can actually also be used as what's called a gamma knife. So in a minute, we'll have a look at that as well. So technetium 99M is an excited nuclei that wants to emit a gamma particle. It has a half-life of approximately six hours, which makes it very suitable for medical scans because it means it's not going to stay in, around in your body for too long. So in medicine, people attach the technetium 99 isotope to a pharmaceutical product. And that product has been designed to target whichever organ or bit of tissue in the human body that you want to look at. So bone marrow is a common example. And so this is injected into the patient. Wait a while until that pharmaceutical product enters the appropriate organ or tissue. And then the patient is put in a scanner and the gamma radiation is detected and this can build up quite a detailed picture of what's going on inside those tissues or organs and so it can highlight any problems with them. Now a gamma knife is a relatively new development in medicine. In a gamma knife the doctors use a cobalt, cobalt 60 source. They actually have about 200 of these sources and they're very good for very targeted radiation therapy. So these can be used to target brain tumors. So the patient would lie down, they'd then have 200 of these gamma ray sources coming at them from different directions. Now these gamma rays will travel as rays and they're going to intersect exactly where the tumor is in the patient. And so individually, these gamma rays are not very damaging as they've got a very low ionizing ability. However, when you have 200 of these targeted rays all hitting the same location, 
that starts to cause damage. So this is a very effective way of killing off a brain tumour and doing very little damage to the surrounding tissue. And it's a lot less invasive than having to do a surgical procedure on the patient. So in this video, we've looked at the different properties of alpha, beta and gamma radiation. And we've seen how these different properties makes them suitable for different applications in medicine. In the next video, we're going to be having a look at a different application of nuclear isotopes. We're going to be looking at exactly how a nuclear power station works. Thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming this video.